Good evening, members of the university community, past and retired, students, ladies and gentlemen, all representatives of the Alliance Francaise, welcome. It is my great pleasure and honor to extend a very warm welcome to you all to this, our inaugural Hulthard Mela Distinguished Lecture. We are delighted and honored to have you share in this very memorable event. The Department of Modern Languages and Literatures notes the launch of this distinguished lecture with great satisfaction and pleasure. We take this opportunity to extend a special welcome to a former member of our department who this evening is here in a special position as our keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Wilson. Welcome. And thank you so very much for agreeing to do this lecture today. I would also like to recognize at this time Mr. Carlton Lorry, former director of student services and the former warden of Irving Hall, who is a former student of Professor Coulthard, so he's um, doing triple formers today, and Dr. Marie Jose Zengotayo, who is not a former student of either but is a former colleague of Mr. Mill and is also taking part in the program this evening. This distinguished lecture is timely and appropriate as we contemplate the great esteem with which these two scholars and former UWI faculty members are regarded. Many years ago, before some of us who are present here today, were even considered for Earth residents. They came to the Caribbean, specifically Jamaica, to share their experiences as academics, their knowledge, their command of French and Spanish respectively, and to contribute to the growth of their separate Spanish and French departments here at the UWI. Professor Gabriel George Coulthard joined the faculty of Gabriel, thank you Mrs. Dash, joined the faculty of arts and education in 1950 when there was a small Spanish department. Mr. Melo became a member of the French department in 1951. Both were titans who served the university with great generosity, creativity, and outstanding scholarship. Mr. Melo also established himself as a superb administrator. He served as head of the Department of French on two separate occasions, as dean of the Faculty of Arts and General Studies on three separate occasions, and when the Cave Hill campus was without a principal, he was quickly dispatched to manage that campus until a replacement was found. I did not even know Professor Coulthard, but as an undergraduate student in Spanish, I frequently used his publications. I distinctly remember spending many hours reading Raza y Color en el Caribe. Perhaps there are some of you who also recall the usefulness of some of Mr. Mailer's publications. Our special guest speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Wilson, shared with me some time ago that when she became head of the Department of French, Mr. Mailer advised her of some critical strategies that would ensure the success of her tenure. She always remembers him with great admiration and respect. He was disciplined, focused, 
organized, respectful, proactive, and hardworking. Many others also remember Professor Coulthard with deep reverence for the man, for his intellect, and his love for his students and Jamaica. These are some of the many reasons that informed our decision to honor their memories and underline and recognize their contributions to the now combined Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Their individual legacies must not be allowed to fall into oblivion. With this, we officially launch the Cool Third Mailer Distinguished Lecture. I have great pleasure now in inviting one of our third year students, Darian Reed, to present the poem Orage by Jacques Roman. Thank you. Bonjour. Orage, Jacques Roman. Le vent chassa un troupeau de bisons blancs dans la vaste prairie du ciel. Silencieux et puissant, ils écrasèrent le soleil. Le soleil s'éteignit. Le vent hurla c'est une femme au mal d'enfant. La pluie accourut, fille de feu et de la mer. Elle accourut en dansant et tira sur le monde des rideaux de brume. Les feuilles chantèrent en tremblant comme des débutantes de musical. Va le tonnerre et applaudit. Alors, Tout se tue pour laisser applaudir le tonnerre. Des fleurs moururent sans avoir vécu. Les palmiers agitèrent leurs éventails contre la chaleur. Un troupeau de bisons émigra de l'Orient à l'Occident. Et la nuit arriva comme une femme en deuil. Merci. Merci. Thank you very much, Darian. And we have many outstanding students of both French and Spanish, and we're very proud of them and always seizing the opportunity to allow them to show off their linguistic competence. There are many others who have also made significant contributions to the departments of Spanish and French, now the Modern Languages and Literatures Department. We recognize them at this moment and reassure them all, as well as you, that we do not in any way undervalue their service by not naming a lecture in their honor at this time. Among them are Dr. Sheila Cartel, don't know if she's here as yet, um, Dr. Bridget Jones, Dr. Gertrude Busher, Mr. Joseph Pereira, who is here, and I, he doesn't like um, to be identified on these occasions, but please give him a special... <laughs> Dr. Lal Narayan Singh, Professor Michael Dash, Dr. Elizabeth Wilson, who is our keynote speaker, as I said before. <laughs> Professor Claudette Williams, who sent her apologies for not being able to make it today. She is not here. Miss Annette Insanali, and others. And I hope that I have not um, left out anybody. If I have, it's simply because somebody didn't remind me. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would now like to invite Mr. Carlton Lowry to present a brief biography of Professor Gabriel Coulthard. Mr. Lowry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was privileged to have been taught by Professor Coulthard in 1969 when I was a second year student. I can still see him walking towards our classroom in N1 very purposefully as if he had a mission to fulfill and there was not a moment to lose. Professor George Robert Gabriel Coulthard, a dedicated researcher and educator, was born on August 6, 1921, in Bradford, Yorkshire, England. He studied languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, at Oxford University from 1939 to 1942, and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree with distinction in spoken French and Spanish. He worked under the mentorship of Sir Eugen Millington Drake and Sir Kenneth Grubb at Canning House, UK, and Hudson Institute, Washington, DC, from 1946 to 1950. During this time, Professor Coulthard sharpened and expanded his already expansive language skills and knowledge of Latin American matters, such as politics, business, economics, and the promotion of the Latin American language, culture, and history. An expert in Latin American studies, he taught several courses in international universities, including Universidad de Oriente in Cuba, University of Puerto Rico, University of Mexico, and the Universidad Central de Ecuador. He received his doctorate of philosophy in Latin American literature in 1951. Professor Coulthard had a long and rewarding association with the departments of Spanish and Modern Languages at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus. As one of the first members of staff in the then Faculty of Arts, he joined the Department of Spanish as an assistant lecturer in 1950. His reputation as an excellent lecturer and keen scholar soon paved the way for his promotion to the position of lecturer in 1951 and senior lecturer in 1958. His linguistic prowess in Spanish, French, and Portuguese afforded him the opportunity to serve as external examiner for modern languages at the University of Hong Kong from 1959 to 1961. He rose to the rank of professor of Latin American literature in 1967. Professor Coulthard's desire to improve the production of both the spoken and written Spanish of his students propelled him in 1967 to organize and implement an annual summer school language immersion program in Merida, Mexico. He himself was an avid traveler and often used his summer vacations to travel for research purposes and to also discover new places and their culture. Among the countries Professor Coulthard visited were Panama, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Chile, Argentina, Spain, the African continent, Portugal, Hong Kong, and Cuba. He very competently served the department as head from 1967 to 1971. He also served as director of studies in the Faculty of Arts from 1961 assisting the dean in advising and monitoring, and monitoring students throughout their courses. His excellent language skills and extensive grasp of Latin American and Caribbean culture allowed him the opportunity to represent the vice chancellor on official visits throughout the region. In 1967, he was appointed to the UNESCO Commission for the Integral Study of Latin American Literature and was invited as an expert to Cuba where he delivered a lecture entitled African Influences in Caribbean Literature at a symposium there. From 1968 to 1970, he was regularly invited to conduct one to two week seminars 
and present papers on Latin American and Caribbean literature at international universities such as Yale, Laval University in Quebec, and College of the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. In April 1970, he was invited to Howard University as a visiting lecturer to speak on La Desenajenación de la Cultura Hispanoamericana Mediante el Nuevo Indigenismo y la Negritude, The Disenchantment of Hispanic American Culture Through New Indigenism and Negritude. Professor Coulthard was a member of the selection committee and was instrumental in obtaining four Abraham Lincoln scholarships from the Mexican government for Jamaican students to study at institutions of higher learning. His many Latin American and Caribbean connections allowed the university library to receive valuable and generous donations of Latin American and Caribbean books from various agencies and organizations. Internationally renowned as an authority on indigenist and Latin American literature, he published extensively in the field. Five books and more than 20 articles in important journals, focusing on race relations and identity, and clearly representing his perception of in and insight into the Latin American culture, politics, literature, and thinking. His research interests were varied, and he demonstrated very sound scholarship in each area. Among his most notable articles are The Writer in the Revolution, Literary Development in Russia and Cuba Since Their Respective Revolutions in 1974, Negritude, Reality and Mystification in 1970, The Situation of the Writer in Contemporary Cuba, 1967, and A New Vision of the Indian in Mexican Literature of the Post-Revolutionary Period in 1963. His books, Anthology of Caribbean Literature, 1966, and Raza y Color en la Literatura Antillana, Race and Color in the Caribbean Literature, 1962, are well known. Jean Franco, a distinguished scholar in the field of Latin American literature, in her review of Professor Kulha's book, Raza y Color, noted that the book is a valuable, quote, a valuable introduction to Caribbean literature and is a competent survey of the whole gamut of relationships between the races as reflected in the works of French, English, and Spanish-speaking writers. And I was looking through my bookshelves, and I came across this other book, written in 1614 by a Peruvian writer, Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala, entitled in English, New Chronicle and Good Government. It's an Indian account of pre-Incas and, and the Incas of Peru to be presented to the King of Spain. And but this copy, this edition, is a translation with notes and introduction by G.R. Cousard in 1968, published by the University of the West Indies. As you can see, we didn't have the press then. But I, I treasure this as a memento, and I've kept it for these last 48 years. And I, I think it can last another. <laughs> if I can last another 48 years. <laughs> Professor Coulthard was described by his colleagues as a very lively, extremely courteous, and friendly person. With the reputation of being a very engaging and stimulating lecturer, he also enjoyed very good relationships with his students. To us, Professor Coulthard was regarded as a very astute, caring, people-oriented, passionate, and approachable person. His exceptional command of the Spanish language and his vast knowledge in the fields of Latin American and Spanish American literature and culture afforded him the opportunity to arouse and awaken a passion for the Spanish language and Latin American literature and culture in his students. We often spoke of his enriching, thought-provoking, and insightful lectures which sensitized us to the social, cultural, and political issues that confronted the Ibero-American world. A former head of the Department of Modern Languages called Professor Coulthard, quote, an excellent and inspiring teacher, end quote. We affectionately yet respectfully called him Coulty when we didn't think he was listening. <laughs> but I'm sure that he sometimes heard us and must have smiled to himself. 
Some of Professor Kuta's closest friends were prominent literary figures, like the Chilean poet and Nobel Prize winner, Pablo Neruda, Ecuadorian novelist, Aldalberto Ortiz, Argentine poet and short story writer, Jorge Luis Borges, the Peruvian novelist and anthropologist, Jose Maria Arguedas, and the Ecuadorian poet and historian, Jorge Carrera Antave. He was married to Helen, and they had two children, a daughter, Anna, and a son, Paul. Professor Gabriel Cuta died in Merida, Mexico, on the 10th of August, 1974, during his annual summer school language immersion program for UWI students and lecturers of Spanish. Even in death, Professor Cuta's passion and kinship with Latin American and the Caribbean was cemented through the request at his funeral for donations to be made to the Kulta Memorial Fund to promote closer ties between the English and Spanish speaking peoples of the Western Hemisphere because that was so very dear to his heart. Excuse me. The University of the West Indies and academic communities worldwide were deprived of, by his sudden passing, a distinguished and prolific scholar. His legacy lives on through his scholarship and a number of the Spanish literature courses in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures still use his publication as part of the key reading list. He was instrumental in crafting some of these courses, which though modified, still reflect some of his core objectives and works. The Department of Modern Languages and Literatures continues to memorialize him through a special prize that is named in his honor and awarded to the most outstanding second year student in two Spanish American literature courses, and of course, through this distinguished lecture series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lori. Um, and I, I have to say that we were very impressed with the UWI archives because there was such an abundance of material, information on both Mr. Mailer and Professor Coulthard. And I'd like to recognize Ms. Dijon Lingo who helped me a lot with the research on the lives of these two individuals. I would now like to invite another student, um, Jamal McKnight, to read for us the recollections of personal recollections of Professor Kulthad that were written by Dr. Lancelot Cowie who studied at the Mona campus. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. He'll tell you he's from Tobago. And he's currently serving as the ambassador of the Republic of Trinidad and, Cuba, and Tobago in Havana, Cuba. Um, Jamal McKnight, another of our very good students, will come and read those recollections for us. Jamal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, all right. Okay. My recollection of the late Gabriel Coulthard dates back to my first encounter with this colossus of Latin American studies at the University of the West Indies Undercraft at Mona, Jamaica, on October in 1966. He struck me as being mild-mannered, urbane, and embracing all the qualities of a learned Hispanist. We conversed in Spanish for almost an hour, sharing contemporary issues of Latin America and its traditions. I had just completed a fruitful academic stint at the, univer at the univer Universidad Central in Venezuela, and Professor Kulta treated me as an academic equal, urging me to accept the challenges of future research on Latin American literature and culture. During my Spanish studies at Mona, the relationship grew deeply with his academic with his dynamic lectures on outstanding poets such as Neruda, Vallejo, and Guillén. My passion for indigenista literature 
was inspired by Coulthard's scholarly writings and his personal contacts with intellectuals in the field. When I challenged him in the classroom about his assertions on Mexican male violence to women during their weekend alcoholic binges, he did not discard my opinion, but delivered a long discourse on the subject which I was able to substantiate in later years as a researcher in Mexico. Equally significant was his humility in accepting my interpretation of Rosario Castellano's novel entitled Oficio de Tinieblas. My presentation to the final year tutorial class was based on solid research which refuted the arguments of our esteemed professor. <laughs> this was the hallmark of Gabriel, extreme modesty and a willingness to promote independent thought and novel analyses among his charges. Finally, he recommended two postgraduate scholarships for my fieldwork in Mexico, which led to the successful completion of my doctoral thesis at UWE. This attests to his unswerving faith in my ability. I will long remember his pioneering work in exposing young scholars to the Yucatan Peninsula and the study of Mayan civilization. Merida, with its peculiar architecture, rich Indian heritage, music, and craftsmanship was the ideal setting for the UA exchange students. This was written by His Excellency Dr. Lance McCoy, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary at the Embassy of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in Havana, Cuba. Thank you. And I hope it would not be out of place for me to say that, to suggest that Professor Kunta had loved Merida so much that he died there. I will now invite Dr. Marie-José Zengotay, a senior lecturer in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, to present a brief biography of Mr. William Naylor. Dr. Zengotay. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I will read excerpts of the citation for Mr. William Mailer. And I don't guarantee that it's going to be good, right, because there is much to say. Um, I'm, I was not a student of Mr. Mailer, but I met him when I, was, I got my first contract in Jamaica in 79. And I should say that Mr. Miller, by his examples and by his method, shaped my own teaching principles. So Mr. Miller uh, was born on December 18, in 1999, in Achterrader in Scotland, uh, 1999. 1999. Nine, 19, sorry. Yes, 19. My apologies uh, that I would, that he would have been a toddler now. Well, but it is 1919 in Octorado, Scotland. He started his university education as at uh, Edinburgh University in 1938, but his studies were interrupted by World War II, and he was he joined the army, the British Army, during that period from 1940 up to 1946. During his military service uh, in the army, Mr. Mailer rose to the rank of Major R.A and his aptitude for language learning allowed him to acquire a good working knowledge of the Indian language Urdu. And by parenthesis, I should tell you that uh, when uh, there was a Urdu speaker that came in the 70s here, and Mr. Miller was able to engage in conversation with that uh, lecture. So when Mr. Miller withdrew from the Army Reserve in 1951, he was granted the honorary rank of Captain R.A. And I was very surprised to, to have to know that he has served in the mythical British uh, Indi Indian Army. The, in the, 
Le Régiment du Bengal, that was, that was a kind of literary reference for me to hear that he had served in that army in India. Mr. Miller subsequently returned to his university studies in 1946 and spent a year as a foreign language assistant at the secondary school in Rouen, France, which, is, which was part of the requirement for the MA honors degree at the University of Edinburgh. His intellectual prowess and enthusiasm for teaching afforded him the opportunity of being recruited as a full-time English teacher in the second half of the assistantship program. On completion of his studies at the University of Edinburgh, Mr. Miller joined the academy staff at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland as an assistant lecturer responsible for honors teaching in medieval and 16th century French literature and, and history in, the, in French language. Mr. Miller's colleague often remarked that he possessed the excellent neonative competence in French. He also had a good reading knowledge of German. Mr. Miller's specific research interests were French literature, French grammar, and philology. He had played an important role in supervising and conducting extramural classes through his work at the Alliance Francaise. So, so Mr. Miller's passion, 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 sorry, Mr. Miller's passion for language learning, specifically the French language, led him to pursue a Master of Arts four-year honors degree at the University of Indeburg, Indeburg in 1938. He distinguished himself at the very stage, every stage of his studies. For example, in the first two years, he attained distinction in all his examinations. In addition, he was a recipient of numerous awards and scholarships, such as the Cowan House Scholarship and various French bursaries from La Sorbonne. In 1948, Mr. Miller graduated from the University of Edinburgh with a Master of Arts First Class Honors degree in French language literature and philology. Mr. Miller's discipline and dedication to mastering the French language paved the way for him to receive a postgraduate grant from the University of Edinburgh to pursue a license, licence et lettres, a uh, Bachelor of Art degree at the prestigious French University La Sorbonne from 1948 to 1950. His academic dexterity served him well, and he obtained four certificates in French literature, French grammar and philology, Romance philology, Provençal philology and literature, and graduated with distinction. So after this experience, Mr. Miller joined the University of the West Indies, so he traveled to the Caribbean, and he, he joined the faculty that at the time it was the University College of the West Indies, UCY, in 1951, and embraced the opportunity to serve the university in various academic and administrative capacities. These include being the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and General Studies, which is the Faculty of Humanities today, from 1964 to 1966, 1967, to 1968, and then 1970 to 1972. He acted as a principal of the Cable campus for three months in 1967, from April to July, and he was also the chairman of the Committee on Examinations that, was, that became uh, later the Board of Examinations from 1967 to 1979. Mr. Miller served with excellence in all these positions. Something should be said about uh, his teaching and his personality. Mr. Miller was an exemplary teacher. A former head of the Department of Modern Languages, in his characterization of Mr. Miller, noted that he was thorough and con uh, thorough and conscientious teacher. His students were often referred to as being intellectually aware 
and having a sound knowledge of the French language by various examiners, particularly the external examiners. Uh, the testimony from French colleagues and students, uh, according to them, Mr. Miller was a very skillful language teacher who was always cheerful and had a very good sense of humor. And he was also a man of integrity with excellent interpersonal skills who always has his students' best interest at heart, an absolutely reliable person and a solid scholar. Mr. Miller was very passionate about the French language and the, not only the learning but the study of the French language. And he spent uh, almost uh, all I would say all his life, academic life, compiling lexicographical research on two major books throughout his tenure at the University of the West Indies. He collected, he gathered information to, uh, for a dictionary of French terms used in literary criticism and a vocabulary book entitled Vocabulary of French Literary Essay. And I should add, uh, in the last years uh, when I met him, he was uh, ceaselessly working on uh, the argot, the slang, the French slang. He had become passionate about slang, and he had compiled, by the time he died, he had compiled a huge database, well, use that word, database now, but they were cards. Flashcards about the slang, also. Uh, some words, a few words about his contribution to the departments of French and modern languages. Mr. Miller gave a long and conscientious service to the Department of French and Modern Languages. For many years, he undertook the arduous task of overseeing all the duties for the French department, which included the division of work among French lecturers the drafting of the syllabus, and the preparation of the examinations, as well as teaching several French language and literature honor courses, such as the 16th century literature, 17th century literature, 18th century also, and prose composition. Mr. Miller's vast experience, input, advice, and leadership was indispensable to the department. As a senior lecturer, he was instrumental in developing and teaching several undergraduate and postgraduate courses. As head of department, Mr. Miller's expertise and efficiency were both vital to the smooth functioning of the department. He spearheaded and the designing and revamping of courses and regulation, regulations. His supervision of the department was carried out with sensitivity and complete competence. Mr. Mailer's invaluable contribution to the department afforded him the opportunity to extend his contract beyond retirement to assist the department in transitioning to the semester system. And uh, this is where I met him the second time that I came to UWE in 1989, where he, was contribu he contributed to the revamping of the course and, uh, and also he contributed to the transition to the semester system at the faculty and the university level. And um, I should add also that uh, Mr. Miller had a great contribution. He was a f uh, to the Alliance Francaise. And uh, I salute the members of the Alliance that are here present and remind them that Mr. Miller was a founding member of the Alien Francaise, and he worked as the treasurer, secretary, assistant secretary for many years. And after he, he was even the president of the Alliance at a certain period of time. And it was a time where the Alliance didn't have much money, so it was a great contribution. He taught at the Alliance as well. And uh, after he, fin he finished his service, as a member of the executive of the Alliance, he remained very attached to the Alliance, participating in all activities. 
until the last day of his life. Uh, like all great scholars, educators, leaders, and visionaries, Mr. Miller understood that excellence requires complete devotion to a task or skill. As such, he systematically and consistently ensured that each summer he traveled with his family to Europe, specifically to France or a francophone country, to utilize their library services and make contact with other French scholars to keep up to date with the latest developments of the f in the field of French language, literature, and uh, linguistics as well. Uh, in conclusion, uh, it is uh, Mr. Miller uh, passed away uh, suddenly on the 14th of July, 1992. And uh, it was a shock to everybody uh, in the department at that time because uh, the 14th of July was the day we were hoping to celebrate the 14th of July at the French Embassy that evening when the news came of his passing. So he, the, certainly the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures recognized that they had lost a br brilliant mind and educator with invaluable expertise in the field of foreign language learning in recognition of Mr. Miller's significant contribution to the department, a number of awards and bursaries have been instituted and awarded annually to outstanding, outstanding French students in the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zengotayo. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for being here. And I know that many of you are here um, even more so because of our keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Wilson. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Wilson, who is a retired senior lecturer from First, the Department of French, and then the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, as well as a former head of the Department of French. Her main research interests are writing by Caribbean women, Francophone Caribbean, and African literature, and translation. She has translated poetry and prose, as well as several novels. With her sister, the writer Pamela Mordecai, she co-edited co the first anthology of prose writing by Caribbean women writers, her true, true name, which was done by Heinemann in 1989. She has been a visiting scholar at universities in the USA and Canada, and was a senior Fulbright fellow at Radcliffe College in 1989. For many years, she served as assistant chief examiner and the chief examiner of French for CSEC and CAPE, respectively. Dr. Elizabeth Wilson, fondly known as Betty, is a wonderful soul. Um, somebody in the department who didn't know her at all asked me, came to me just yesterday and said, tell me something about her because when I came she was no longer here. And I said that she is a warm, really sincere, honest person. That is, that is how I thought I would sum up the person I have come to know and appreciate. Dr. Betty, I invite you now to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ramsey. She didn't tell you, she's the current head of the Modern Languages Department, and she has extraordinary persuasive powers. I tried to get out of this because I thought of people who I told her, I, she said, would, she told me she was going to do this, and I said, oh, do you want me to give you a list of people who could do the lecture? She said, no. 
I want you to do it. And I said, no, Paulette, not me, but here I am. So, good evening, distinguished guests, representatives from the embassies, colleagues, family, friends, and especially some former students I have not seen for a very long time like Ambassador Wheeler, who was in the very first class I taught at UWI, and Ms. Hassan Hemmings, who was in the very first class I ever taught in my life at Alpha when I was 21. So I thank you so much for coming. I did not know Professor Coulthard except by reputation, because I didn't go to UWI and I had friends who were in his class, so I heard a lot about him. But you have heard the tremendous contribution that he made in this university. And I thank Professor Matthew Smith for pointing me to the fact that in 1962, he published that book that was mentioned in Spanish, Race and Color in the Caribbean. And I, I, when I went on the internet, I found, I was a little confused because I saw G.R. Coulthard, George Coulthard, Gabriel Coulthard, but then I, I found that he had also published an anthology of Caribbean literature in 1966 that crossed the different languages. So thank you very much, Matthew. He was really one of the early Caribbeanists with people like uh, Dr. Bridget Jones and Dr. Beverly Omrod Noakes who actually taught the first course in Caribbean literature in the French department before West Indian literature was taught in the English department, I'm told, <laughs> when Mr. Mailer was head. So I was not Mr. Mailer's student either because, as I said, I wasn't here. But when I was doing my A-levels in those days, we called it um, higher schools, Mr. Mailer was my oral examiner. And I can still remember his voice. I remember that day we had a dictation first, and I can even still remember sentences from that dictation. I won't tell you how long ago that is. But when I came to the department, Mr. Mailer was the head. And as Mary Jose said, he shaped, it was my first full-time university post, and he really shaped my career. He was wonderful as a mentor. He was rigorous, but so gentle. And when I became head, he had been head for a long, long time. And he left me an exercise book. I can still see it. Head of department notes. What you did month by month. And it was absolutely wonderful and invaluable guide. It should have been published. So in May, you look for new lecturers for October. Things like that were in that book. So I am so honored and privileged to be asked, and I'm glad I finally decided to say yes. I think that Professor Coulthard would be pleased with the topic because he was a Caribbeanist, he crossed languages, as Matthew pointed out to me and as you've heard today. And I know Mr. Mailer, I, I would do it for Mr. Mailer because he was really such a wonderful person to me. I feel very much like he did. He got an award once and he said, I feel like a soldier who should be getting an award for long service and I'm being given an award for gallantry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I feel. I feel I should be sitting there listening to somebody else. But here I am. Okay, my topic is literature and activism. Literature as activism case studies from Caribbean women's writing in French. And I want to thank Mrs. Frances Salmon and the library staff for preparing this little exhibition of the women that I'm going to talk about. At very short notice, just a few days, I had this idea. Professor Ramsey said, yes, good idea, and they did it. So I want to begin with a few remarks about the structure of the presentation. As a littéraire, as they say in French, a literature person, I'm going to discuss four Caribbean writers, three of whom may be unfamiliar to many of you because they write in French, language barriers in the Caribbean being what they are. But I'm hoping that after this lecture, you'll go and read some of the novels that you are hearing about because they have been published in English, the ones I'm going to talk about. 
But in the first half of my talk, I want to spend some time looking at the question of literature and activism, both from the reader's point of view as well as the writer's. I begin with a quotation from each of several writers whose work I really admire, and which for me sum up what I think activism in literature is about. First, from Edwige Dantica, who says, create dangerously for people who read dangerously. That is what I've always thought it meant to be a writer. Second, Velma Pollard, speaking about what someone called her fighting words on the page as opposed to her mild personality. I don't know if that's true. I do not march, but I write. Next, Edward Ball. There is no such thing as only literature. Every line commits you. For Bohr, this commitment is both an aesthetic as well as a political commitment. For, as Toni Morrison says, the best art is political, and you ought to make it unquestionably political and irrevocably beautiful at the same time. Finally, a quote from Alice Walker, who clearly considers herself an activist. Alice Walker says, activism is my rental for living on the planet. So what is activism? Activism is generally defined in political or social terms as commitment to a cause. The dictionary says, the use of direct and noticeable action to achieve a result, usually a political or social one. Activists are usually referred to in the context of trying to highlight or achieve certain rights. Once a writer treats certain themes, takes or seems to take a position on a certain issue, he or she is often considered an activist. So we have so-called feminist writers who are viewed as activists on behalf of women's rights. A poem like Olive Senior's Colonial Girls School or her meditation in yellow, on yellow is seen as taking an activist position as a response from someone in the empire writing back to quote Helen Tiffin. In a post-colonial context, there's scarcely a writer who could not be seen in this light. What is literary activism then? To define specifically what literary activism is, the American poet Amy King invited a diverse group of writers, mainly writers of color, to consider the question, what is literary activism? She consulted a collection of activist poets for their interpretations of what literary activism meant to them. Their responses have much in common with the context and concerns of Caribbean writers. Here are a few of them. For Rosebud Ben-Oni, Mexican and Jewish, Literary activism meant, I quote, advocating for myself and for others who didn't fit so neatly, didn't play so nicely in existing racial, sexual, and religious categories in the so-called canon. For Jason Koo, Asian American, it meant, quote, simply getting certain people seen, included fully in the room. He says, Helping marginalized others be seen is a crucial way of breaking down racism and other forms of prejudice. Jessica Reedy, a Romani, gypsy woman writer says, activism begins with words, voice, visibility. How can you fight for your struggle for basic human rights if people do not know that your struggle exists, if they do not hear a word about it. I think of the enlightening shock value of a testimonial text 
like I, Rigoberta Menchu, an Indian woman in Guatemala, and also of Edwige Dantica's The Farming of Bones, among the first texts to treat these hitherto buried themes. The writers quoted by King all manifest what some have called hybrid subjectivities. They live in two worlds. They live between two cultures. This might account in part for their activism on behalf of particular causes. Finally, Amy King says that for herself, one needs to hear about the lived realities and ideas of the other, capital O, so that we might begin to empathize approach understanding, and be willing to relinquish certain privileges, including risking our own safety in order to demand the safety and platforms for others not automatically entitled or granted it by birthright. The writer Thomas Glave sums it up. He says, what does literary activism mean for me? I think it means work by writers who show that they give a damn about the world beyond themselves. King further observes that as a poet, poetry continues to enjoy the luxury, she says, of not being obligated to patrons. I quote, which is why you'll find numerous poets in the vanguard of articulating the least popular but most transgressive and challenging ideas going in any given period, including the present. Edward Ball has said that someone once remarked to him that literature is no longer aid-worthy, but perhaps this has a bright side, as Amy King points out, because poets and other writers in the Caribbean, I think, are not usually tied because of financial patronage. Certainly, the four writers we will look at have all articulated transgressive and challenging ideas and given voice to the voiceless in support of a cause. The Puerto Rican scholar Marianne Gossa Esquilin says, with my students, I seek to be an activist through Caribbean texts. And then she went on to detail the topics that Caribbean writers usually treat. I recently read an interesting BBC article sent to me by Verma Pollard, which said that the Sudan has a tradition of what they call lyrical activism. For decades, their troops marched to traditional lyrics against outside oppressors. And currently, the article says, young Sudanese poets are using similar tactics to fight censorship and repression from their own government. So they've turned the tables. Here at home, we have that great exemplar of lyrical activism, Bob Marley, whose music and lyrics continue to inspire hundreds of thousands globally to get up, stand up, stand up for their rights, and not to give up the fight. Literary activism, then, has to do with voice and visibility, with getting certain people seen, included in the room, with giving voice to those who would otherwise go unheard, breaking barriers, and promoting understanding and dialogue. It also has to do with who is the target audience, the actual audience, and with how an audience is being invited or impacted, as one editor said. Coming close to home and speaking of language barriers, I must point out the work done by women scholars and writers who have been activists in terms of attempting to break down those barriers. Like the Association of Caribbean Historians, the Association of Caribbean Women Writers and Scholars has from the very beginning had members from all different linguistic regions of the Caribbean, including the Netherlands, Antilles, and Suriname. And the first publications of and on women's writing in the Caribbean as a field of study 
have tried to show a similar inclusiveness. I think of the short story anthology, Green Cane and Juicy Flotsam, 1991, the poetry anthology, Creation Fire, 1991, the prose writing collection, Her True True Name, 1989, and critical works like the influential and pioneering Out of the Kumbla, 1990. All crossed linguistic, cultural, and traditional historical frontiers and boundaries, a heritage of our colonial past, in an effort to establish connections and a unity akin to Kamau Brathwaite and Edouard Glissant's image of an undivided Caribbean whose unity is geologically and metaphorically submarine. And I think Professor Coulthard's anthology 1966 would have contributed to this anthology. It is still available on the internet. In the early days, in a context of West Indian Anglophone, as opposed to French Caribbean or Latin American literature, this inclusivity was innovative. We have come a long way since then, though not far enough. reading and writing, the reader's part. Create fearlessly, Dantica has urged. Create dangerously for people who read dangerously. In researching this talk, one of the first articles I happened on was a piece entitled, Reading for Peace? Question sign. Literature as Activism, an Investigation into New Literary Ethics and the Novel by an Australian scholar, Shady Cosgrove. Cosgrove asked the question, how can reading novels affect our capacity for empathy and thus our capacity for social change? By framing the question in that way, not can reading novels affect our capacity for empathy, but how can reading novels affect our capacity for empathy? It is evident that Cosgrove believes in the transformative power of literature. She examines, among other considerations, the nature of the reader and the reading process and the role of the imagination. Many years ago at the Faculty of Arts Prize Giving, the guest speaker, the poet Ralph Thompson, spoke of the importance of students having access to courses that develop their imagination, and the dire consequences of a lack of imagination. Cosgrove concludes, reading and writing support our ability to empathize. Reading and writing the novel can lay critical groundwork for imagining, for imagining alternative realities and worlds. Especially in view of this, it concerns me greatly when I hear it said of someone, especially in a position of leadership, he or she does not read. We can think of recent examples. Perhaps the more powerful the reader, the graver the potential consequences. Cosgrove's paper is essentially concerned with what she calls the new literary ethics but it touches on important issues of concern to us this evening. Why teach literature? Cosgrove asserts that the new literary ethicists like Gayatri Spivak, the critic, for example, believe that the literary can be a vehicle for social change. So what have Caribbean writers, in this case, four women novelists from the French-speaking Caribbean, contributed to issues of understanding the other, defining the other, exposing inequities to issues of peace, justice, fighting crime and violence in their societies through their writings, and especially their writing seen through the lens of social or political activism. In what ways have their novels impacted the reader? Should we be exposing our future leaders, lawyers, diplomats, decision makers, even doctors, 
as a matter of course to literature rather than solely to their particular disciplines, political science, economics, accounting, medicine. Against this background, I will look at four Caribbean women whose activism together with their writing, as well as through their writing, has raised conscience, meaning in French both awareness, consciousness, as well as conscience. How have they liberated, brought out from the shadows, voices and people who were otherwise unheard, unknown, unnamed, ignored, rejected? In Bill Mailer's beloved 17th century, the aim of art was to plaire et instruire, to please and to teach. The 17th century poet Nicolas Boileau said, in his art poétique that in the art of the theater, written all in verse at that time, le secret est d'abord de plaire et de toucher. The secret is first and foremost to please and to touch, to affect. In other words, to create empathy. The women I will discuss are Marie Chauvet, sometimes called Marie Vieux Chauvet or Chauvet, Edwige Dantica, Yannick Laance, L-A-H-E-N-S, and Giselle Pinot. Their works, aesthetically pleasing, greatly inform, touch, and affect, move their readers. The first three are from Haiti, and Giselle Pinot, born in France, is of Guadeloupean origin, so properly from what is called the French Caribbean. They are all at least bilingual, creolophone, francophone, and anglophone in the case of Edwige Dantica. I'm including Dantica as a reference point because she is most likely to be familiar. From the age of 12, she has lived in the United States. She writes in English, which she calls her stepmother tongue. Her works are translated from English into French. Dantica, however, points out that she thinks and composes, not in English, but in her mother tongue, Haitian or French Creole. She has often spoken about this. Three of the writers are contemporary, and Chauvet, who died in 1976, is considered an important and militant forerunner, an iconic and dominant figure in Francophone women's writing. All four writers are very important for creating a space for voices hitherto unheard. I begin with the case of Marie Chauvet, and I will discuss her work at some length, both because she is the least well known and also because she deserves to be much more widely recognized. 1968 was a tumultuous year in Paris, the year of the famous Événement de Mai, the events of May, a student uprising which eventually led to the first general strike in France. The year was said to mark, I quote, a cultural, social, and moral turning point in the history of France. It sparked an artistic movement which succeeded as a social revolution, though not as a political one." End of quote. In that year, the prestigious Paris publishing house Gallimard brought out a trilogy, three novellas by an upper middle class Haitian woman, a member of the privileged mulatta bourgeoisie, which was to change her life and the lives of those in her circle. Due to the support and instrumentality of Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre's companion and outstanding author and feminist, Marie Chauvet's Amour, Colère, Folie, Love, Anger, Madness saw the light of day. Recognized as an obvious attack on the Duvalier dictatorship, the book was devastating. It had to be suppressed. Fearing retaliation, Chauvet's husband, 
bought all the copies he could find in Haiti. And a few years later, her daughters bought the rest of the entire edition from Gallimard in Paris. But under threat of her life, Marie Chauvet was nevertheless forced to flee Haiti for New York, where she worked as a maid. She never returned. She died in exile in New York in 1973. Born in 1916, Chauvet grew up during the period known as the American occupation of Haiti. She was not a stranger to politics. Her father was a politician, a senator, and an ambassador. She had lived under surveillance during the Duvalier regime. Chauvet was no doubt aware that she was being watched and that her writings might be considered subversive, especially by a totalitarian regime, but that did not deter her. She continued to write and to host meetings of a group of writers and poets, all male. Chauvet's earlier novels, Daughter of Haiti, Dancing on the Volcano, etc., have not been translated into English. But her novels, as well as her plays, dealt with issues of identity, sexuality, race, class, gender politics, conflicts between the classes in Haiti, injustice, social inequality and oppression, especially during the American occupation and later under the Duvalier regime. Her works were severely critical of the status quo in Haiti. But her earlier works were in no way as scathing as the trilogy, openly targeting the Duvalier regime Love, Anger, Madness was perhaps the last straw. Chauvet and her family were in danger. In an article called No Place for Self-Pity, No Room for Fear, and subtitled In Times of Dread, Artists Must Never Choose to Remain Silent, written in 2015, the writer Toni Morrison makes several critical points. She writes, and in view of the situation in Haiti, the background to Chauvet's novel, and of our own times, I'm going to quote what she says in full. She says, I quote, dictators and tyrants routinely begin their reigns and sustain their power with the deliberate and calculated destruction of art, the censorship and book burning of unpoliced prose the harassment and detention of painters, journalists, poets, playwrights, novelists, essayists. This is the first step of a despot whose instinctive acts of malevolence are not simply mindless or evil, they are also perceptive. And I think that's important. Such despots know very well that their strategy of repression will allow the real tools of oppressive power to flourish. Their plan is simple. I'm still quoting Morrison. Select a, use, a useful enemy, an other, capital O, to convert rage into conflict, even war. I am refraining from making comments. <laughs> Limit or erase the imagination that art provides, as well as the critical thinking of, journal, of scholars and journalists. Fake, fake facts. Distinct, distract with toys, dreams of loot, themes of superior religion or defiant national pride that enshrine past hurts and humiliations. End of quote. Morrison's words, a reflection on our time, could have served as a summary of the thieves of the themes in Chauvet's three powerful novellas, which all depict times of dread where the population is dominated by fear. The trilogy, more properly called a triptych of three novellas with connected themes, as one critic has pointed out, focuses on the crippling and destructive nature of fear, a force of social destruction. The novella Amour, Love, the first narrative in the trilogy, begins with a silence 
and absence, marked in the original French text, but missing in English by a line of asterisks. Silence, an intriguing way to begin a narrative. But the reader soon discovers why. Claire, the protagonist, sees herself as a shadow, gliding silently, taken for granted, and as yet unnoticed in her household, but aware of her power. Hers is a perverted power, born of the frustration of being ignored and taken for granted. Claire, as the darkest of her sisters, her name is ironic, is an outsider. <laughs> Still a virgin at 39, and too intelligent for her own good, as her pastor tells her, her traditional and religious upbringing has been oppressive. Framed in her open window, a traditional female spectator space at the beginning of the text, Claire gradually moves outward, and the domestic intrigue develops into first a local and then a national drama. Her personal crisis and the national drama are closely intertwined. I'm going to quote a little from the novel. It starts like this. I watch the drama unfolding, scene by scene, unobtrusive as a shadow, I, the only lucid one, the only dangerous one, and yet nobody around me suspects a thing. The old maid, the one who has never had a husband, who doesn't know what love is, who has never really lived in the true sense of the word. They are wrong. I am savoring my vengeance in silence. It is my silence, my vengeance. I am leaning on my windowsill, watching them. Time passes. The wretchedness of the people grows. To each his lot. Our selfishness becomes the rule. We sink deeper and deeper into cowardice and become resigned. Love is Claire's journal and team, her diary, where she records in detail not only her scheming, but also her frustrated sexual fantasies and her passionate interior life. Chauvet empowers her protagonist and makes her a figure to be reckoned with. Not only does she control the narrative, her voice, her point of view is the only one we hear, but she controls and manipulates the other members of the household and through an act of violence at the end of the novella, she also frees the town and his victims from a cruel and oppressive dictator. One critic says, Vieux Chauvet makes Claire's transformation from invisible puppet master to active community participant, something greater than one woman's self-actualization. Claire is a symbol of a much larger and significant rebellion. For me, Claire is a representation, the expression of Chauvet's political feminist protest and dissent. In the second novella, Anger, Chauvet's concerns center around a family of landowners who wake up one morning to find their land captured, as we would say in Jamaica, and overrun by militia men dressed in black, reminiscent of Duvalier's Tonton Macoult. And you cannot miss that they are based on the Duvalier's Tonton Macoult. In a horrifying reversal of the Beauty and the Beast myth, Rose, the young daughter of the family, is forced by her complicit family to be the innocent and silent sacrificial victim of a political beast an animal who rapes and exploits her in exchange for her family's safety. The members of the family are angry, but seemingly powerless in the face of state terrorism and corruption. The family's part in this unspeakable sadistic ritual, appalling in its explicitness in the text, 
cannot be excused. As one critic points out, there is no doubt that rage over these sickening injustices is infused in anger and that the author's shocking and explicit portrayal of violence is intended to elicit the response of rage in the readers. In the final novella, Madness, hunted, trapped, and in hiding, the poet René and his writer friends live a terrified existence and are finally executed for a conspiracy and for plotting against the security of the state. Toni Morrison's article offers a note of hope. She concludes, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Chauvet speaks, she writes fearlessly, but the trilogy does not end on a similar note of hope. The writers in the final novella pay with their lives. However, the novel, reissued in French in 2005, and in a new English translation published in paperback in 2010, continues to be relevant today. In the last three decades, her works have enjoyed critical attention, and last year, October 2016, there were literary celebrations in New York called Chauvet's Theatres of Revolt to mark the 100th anniversary of her birth. She addresses not only social and political issues, but in her depictions of her female protagonists, raises a number of feminist gender issues which are completely contemporary, as well as matters of global import, like sexual violence and the use of rape as a weapon of terror to control individuals and communities, state-inflicted violence, the suppression of human rights. In addition, her portrayal of the persecution of journalists, writers, and poets in madness hits very close to home. She's considered not just one of the greatest Haitian writers, but one of the greatest, in quotes, French writers. And I was going to read another quote, but in the interest of time, I'll skip it from the text and continue. Come back, in Come Back to Me, My Language, J. Edward Chamberlain quotes from an essay by the Latin American writer Edward Galliano entitled, The Imagination and the Will to Change. Galliano says, the literature that is most political, most deeply committed to the political process of change, can be the one that least needs to name its politics, in the same sense that the crudest political violence is not necessarily demonstrated by bombs and gunshots. He continues, I believe that literature can recover a political revolutionary path every time it contributes to the revelation of reality. A writer whose work certainly contributes to the revelation of reality is Edwige Dantica. Very well known, especially in the United States, Dantica has been writing from a very young age. Still in her 40s, her first novel, published when she was 25, was an Oprah's book club selection. She has always advocated on behalf of Haitians at home and in the diaspora. Hauntingly beautiful, her narratives are filled with suffering and trauma, and yet somehow they manage to challenge violence, injustice, and maintain hope. For me, her most painful novel is The Farming of Bones. Based on a historical event called the Parsley Massacre of 1937, in which by direct order of President Trujillo, thousands of Haitians died at the hands of troops of the Dominican Republic Army or trying to flee across the Massacre River at the border. Life or death depended on an individual's ability to pronounce correctly the Spanish word for parsley, perejil, called in Haitian Creole, 
The novel details the sufferings of those who survived the massacre, the traditionally difficult relationships between Haitians and their nearest neighbor, the unspeakable cruelty of this brief period, and the effects of the massacre on the psyche of the Haitian people. Dantica says she wanted to document the incident and honor the memory of the victims after realizing that the horrors of the slaughter, a form of ethnic cleansing in which dark-skinned Dominicans were also killed, had almost been forgotten even at the site of the massacre. Many died trying to cross the Massacre, massacre River to get back to Haiti. This is a brief description of the death of Odette, one of the victims, and of her revolt. He picked her up and carried her onto the dusky plains in the dark. Following the track inland, we approached a cluster of parrot trees whose furry leaves looked like soft hands reaching down from some higher place, encouraging us to pause once again and rest. As we sat there with Odette under a canopy of trees in the middle of a grassy field, she spat up a chest full of water she had collected in the river. With her parting breath, she mouthed in Creole, Pessi, not calmly and slowly, as if she were asking for it at a roadside garden or open market, not questioning as if demanding of the face of heaven the greater meaning of senseless acts. No effort to say perehil, as if pleading for her life. Que diga amor, love, hate, speak to me of things the world has yet to truly understand, of the instant meaning of each bird's call, of a child's secret thoughts in her mother's womb, of the measure, measured rhythmical time of every man and woman's breath, of the true colors of the inside of the moon, of the larger miracles in small things, the deeper mysteries. But parsley? Was it because it was so used, so commonplace, so abundantly at hand that everyone who desired a sprig could find one? We use parsley for our food, our teas, our baths, to cleanse our insides as well as our outsides. Perhaps the generalissimo in some larger order was trying to do the same for his country. The generalissimo's mind was surely as dark as death. But if he had heard Odette's Pessi, it might have startled him. Not the tears and supplications he would have expected, no shriek from unbound fear, but a provocation, a challenge, a dare. To the devil with your world, your grass, your wind, your water, your air, your words. You ask for perehil, I give you more. End of quote. The Haitian-Dominican question continues to be an unresolved issue today. Dantica sets out in her novel the historical roots of this conflictual relationship and gives voice and visibility to hitherto unnamed humble folk. Her depiction is balanced and nuanced. She reminds her readers with urgency that this struggle persists. Similarly, the deal breaker explores the ways in which the violence and horrors of a totalitarian regime can cast long shadows for generations to come, even outside the home country. At times, the relations between the characters echo and parallel the relationship of the Haitian people to the regime in power. Even in a text as lyrical as the novel Clear of the Sea Light, which is not as grim as the dewbreaker or as harrowing as the farming of bones, but more a love letter about the villagers in a tiny village, Dantica confronts the status quo with themes that involve issues of oppression, injustice, corruption, crime, and violence. In a devastating chapter entitled Ghosts in Creole Chime, Chimeras, after the Creole name given to gang members. She details the inescapable web in which an innocent young man is caught, causing him to lose his life. Simply because of his life circumstances, he gets involved 
with criminal elements who frequent his parents' restaurant in the area. Brilliant in its construction and remarkable for the restraint of the narrative voice, the chapter is an indictment of the indifference and corruption of the powers that be and an ironic commentary on the lot of the poor. In her nonfiction work entitled Create Dangerously, the immigrant artist at work, Dantica reflects on what it means to be an immigrant writer from a country like Haiti. It is a witness. She witnesses lovingly and with passion to the lives of Haitians, famous and humble. Create Dangerously is a very political work and a deeply personal one as well. Create Dangerously, taken from Albert Camus, comes from this work. In a lecture delivered in 1957, at the University of Uppsala, Sweden, Camus, who had just been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, maintained that the writer is necessarily implicated in an age when, he says, even silence has dangerous implications. The writer cannot hope to remain aloof. To create today, he says, is to create dangerously. He asserts, in view of the state of the world, and this in 1957, in the face of so much suffering, if art insists on being a luxury, it will also be a lie. Writers of the 20th century, he said, must know they cannot escape the common misery. And he says, our only justification, if indeed there is a justification, is to speak up in so far as we can for those who cannot do so. Dantica certainly speaks up. Her words speak truth. She draws on her Creole heritage. Her language is often poetic, enigmatic, reminiscent of proverbs and folk wisdom. And at other times, the narrative voice is understated and unemotional. Speaking about Dantica's first collection of short stories, the novelist Paul Marshall says, a silenced Haiti has once more found its voice in Edwige Dantica. In many ways, the restraint and seeming detachment with which the narrative voice in many of Yannick Laon's stories recounts horrific events is reminiscent of Edwige Dantica's unemotional prose. Most of Laonce's stories deal with violence and death. Violence, especially towards women, but also in the wider sense of violence destroying society. Crime, poverty, injustice, fear. Her characters struggle to survive, and in many ways her vision is more dark and despairing. Unfortunately, none of her novels has yet been translated into English, and there is only one version of her short stories, published by the University of Virginia Press in 2010, Aunt Razia and the Spirits, which I translated. It brings together 17 stories from her four collections in French. The critic and scholar Christiane McWard considered La Anse the most, I quote, the most important living female Haitian author in French. And she says of her writing, her short stories in particular demonstrate an art, a style, and a political commitment of the highest caliber. Through the intimate window of Laurence's mode of realism, this collection invites the gaze of the Anglophone world onto her country's unique array of troubles. The collection opens with a story called Death in July, and the titles will give you an intimation of the themes. Petty corruption, the survivors, a shattered day, a commonplace disaster, and the ironically titled Three Natural Deaths, in which the three protagonists each meet a violent death. One critic says her stories have inevitable political dimensions which force the informed reader to ask disturbing questions. There are occasional glim glimpses of hope, 
But what is striking is the deceptively cool, reticent, seemingly dispassionate tone of a lot of her observations. Her stories, written in standard French, belong to what Michael Dash calls the modernist Caribbean tradition, which he says is a lived modernity profoundly connected to resistance. Her stories are innovative in their narrative techniques and in their hybrid stylistic devices. La Anse, who lives in Haiti, is socially and politically activist, both in her life and in her writing. Finally, we come to Giselle Pinault, the last of the four writers. Born in France in 1956 to Guadeloupean parents, Pinot grew up until the age of 14 in a majority white, lower middle class Paris suburb, where her father, as a member of the military, was entitled to state-owned housing. In her essay, Écrire en tant que noir, writing as a black woman, Pinot describes her isolation and her feelings of rejection and humiliation. She was the only black child in her class. Subjected to contempt and overt racism, she longed to belong. In addition, her parents belonged to that generation when, as the critic Richard Burton put it, one became French to the precise extent that one abjured West Indianness. Or to put it differently, the identification with the other, capital O, France, required a prior negation of the West Indian self. Pinot's father, a black man whose uniform and perfect French had captivated her beautiful light-skinned mother, was a passionate supporter of General de Gaulle. Creole was forbidden in their household, and she describes how on her first visit to Guadeloupe at the age of five, she could not communicate. She did not speak a word of Creole. Brilliant at French and at composition, better than her schoolmates, she derived pleasure from writing and from words. But she was bullied, to use a modern term, and unhappy, and she was reluctant to share her humiliations with her parents. It was not until her Guadeloupean grandmother came to live with the family in Paris that Giselle says her world was transformed. That is the story that she tells in the text, Exile According to Julia, Julia is her grandmother, with humor, perspicacity, and a beguiling candor. Ironically, her illiterate, Creole-speaking grandmother, she says, gave her the gift of writing through her fascinating oral tales. Pinot has written several novels and gained many literary prizes. Some of her novels have been translated into English. Her other works deal with very heavy topics, incest, loss, madness, exploitation, problems and challenges confronting women, the past. Her causes are activist, but it is above all her linguistic realization, to quote one critic, her what is called creolized French, which has attracted a lot of critical attention. Her activism, in a sense, has to do with her approach to language as much as anything else. She speaks of her problematic relationship to what she calls her grandmother tongue. It's a stepmother tongue for Dantica and a grandmother tongue for Pino. She calls it ma langue grand maternelle. She's especially praised for what she's said to have done with and to the French language in the process of her writings. Although Pinot came to Creole very late and rarely says that she can still not speak it and her children laugh at her, Pinot is considered a Creolité writer. Creolité, Creoleness. Like Negritude, the Creolité movement was as much a social and political movement as a literary one. Born in Martinique, it was both artistic, linguistic, and political. In the opening sentence of Éloge de la Créolité in Praise of Creoleness, the authors, 
a linguist, Bernabe, and two novelists, Patrick Chamoiseau and Raphael Confiant, assert their identity, proclaim themselves Creole, and say, for us, this will be a state of mind, or rather, a state of vigilance, or better still, a sort of mental envelope within which we will build our world in full awareness of the world. Influenced by orality, Pino says she aims to make heard a different voice. Voice is not a good translation. In French, she uses the word parole, which they translate as language, speech, voice in French. In doing this, one critic suggests that Pinot is, I quote, protecting and promoting her threatened cultural heritage. The critic, Marianne Souriau, says, the recourse to hybrid expression is also a mode of resistance to the linguistic control of the colonial power. Because in deconstructing the linguistic norms, Pinot liberates the French language from its lexical and semantic rigor, thus eliminating its alienating hegemony. It's often said, la langue c'est la patrie, language is my native land, but that is, as we have seen, a great oversimplification. So just a brief word before I come to the conclusion about language and translation. Language is a very political issue in the Caribbean, as we know, as it is in many post-colonial societies. Like the Kenyan Gujiwa Siongo's decision to stop writing in English after he had written several novels, the language of the colonizer, and to write in Kikuyo, his mother tongue, the choice to write in Creole, whether Haitian Creole like Franck Etienne, or Jamaica talk like so many of our writers and poets, Miss Lou, Pam Mordecai, has to be construed as a political as well as an artistic choice. For Pinot, Creole is her grandmother tongue, as I said. Edwige Dantica says it is her stepmother tongue. She articulates this position. It could be said that her works in English are works of or works in translation. Her Haitian Creole thoughts, reflections, stories become transformed in the act of writing into a form of English on the page. And in Create Dangerously, she vividly describes this experience. She's in a radio studio, translating one of her stories from English into Creole because they're going to make it into a play. And she says, translating, retranslating that story from the original English in which I had written it had been a surreal experience. It was as if the voice in which I write, the voice in which people speak Creole that comes out English on paper had been released. And finally, I was writing for people like my Tante Iliana, people who did not read, not because they did not have enough time or because they had too many other gadgets, but because they never learned how. Dantica writes the way she writes, naturally, out of her context. It has been suggested that the fact that she writes in English indicates the importance to her of her audience in the English-speaking Haitian diaspora in the US, and she has a lot to tell them. These diasporas, as they're called, sometimes pejoratively by Haitians in Haiti, are far more empowered economically and educationally to be able to enact change than their brothers and sisters left behind in Haiti but they have a problematic relationship to both their cultures. Dantica speaks of how, on the occasion she describes in the radio station, she remembers the famous Haitian journalist, Jean Dominique, subsequently assassinated, redeeming words to her in what she called her diaspora dilemma. He said, the diaspora are people with feet, with feet planted in both worlds. No need to be ashamed of that. There are more than a million of you. You are all not alone. Pinot's relationship to France and Guadeloupe was similar. So many people can say that they have a diaspora dilemma, even at home. They say every artist, 
every writer is in exile. Finally, we're nearing the conclusion. As I said before, much of post-colonial literature in general is politically committed. Writers in France have traditionally been extremely politically influential, perhaps more so than in English-speaking countries. The French have a long tradition of political engagement. Caribbean and Latin American literature has been greatly influenced by committed writers like Sartre and Camus, and the impact of Fanon on black writers and others and Simone de Beauvoir on feminist writers is undisputed. We are living in an era when at times reality seems increasingly fictional. And at the same time, as I said before, a leader who doesn't read makes me shudder. <laughs> Literature is a key tool in what Cosgrove calls the negotiation of alterity. Alterity, otherness, defined specifically as the quality or state of being radically alien to the conscious self or a particular cultural orientation. By means of the creative imagination, first the writer and then the reader can enter into another's skin, another's reality, the other with a capital O, skin, the other's reality. The other is humanized. Toni Morrison warned of the selection and creation of an other as a useful enemy, a strategy of repression which will allow the real tools of oppressive power to flourish. The world would be a much better place if societies, groups, and individuals had moved even a few small steps beyond fear of difference, feelings of superiority based on difference, and most especially beyond the injustices, cruelty, and indifference born of these feelings of superiority. These are the plagues that these four women writers depict in their novels. Even as we begin to feel that Fanon's analysis of the other doesn't need to be discussed anymore, and that we have moved beyond certain ideologies and harsh practices so vividly portrayed in Dantica's the farming of bones, in Chauvet's novels, in Laurence's stories, in Pinot's memoir, or in the recent film, Hidden Figures. Events in our own society and on the world stage remind us that plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. And that progress, however we define it, and peace are only achieved at the price of eternal vigilance, effort, and struggle. Mark Vonnegut asserts that, I quote, reading and writing are in themselves subversive acts. What they subvert is the notion that things have to be the way they are, that you are alone, that no one has ever felt the way you have. The writers we have looked at in the company of many others from the Caribbean and from around the world are doing their part. The readers, we, need to read and reflect. I salute the schools where English B, that is literature, is a compulsory subject. I wish it were so in our university. And I pray for inspiring, energetic, enthusiastic, gifted language and literature teachers like Bill Mailer and Gabriel Coulter to inspire and mentor our students. But let me conclude on a positive note again with Toni Morrison's words. She says, I know the world is bruised and bleeding. And though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. Thank you.
I thoroughly enjoyed that lecture. And as I sat there, I remembered one of the things I told that person who came to me. I said, she writes beautifully. <laughs> I, I remember when uh, another colleague and I translated a collection of Dominican short stories, and we asked Dr. Wilson to write the preface. And to this day, when I take up the book, it's the preface <laughs> that I love to read, even more than our own translations, because the, she uses language so beautifully, so well. And as she spoke, she confirmed to me that I made a very good choice, uh, which I knew all along. Um, I, I took note of, of the calmness with which she spoke. Um, making her erudite claims. And I was reminded of the calmness with which she has spoken to me on a number of occasions as a, as a younger head of department, particularly when I became a new head of department and she came to me and talked to me and shared with me some of what Mr. Mailer had taught her in that same calm manner. I thank you so much for agreeing to be pressured by me to come in to do this, this lecture. I, I, I know that you all agree with me that this was a particularly interesting presentation on the topic, literature and activism. Literature as a activism, case studies from Caribbean women's writing in French. Um, she now has us asking ourselves, how do we read? Do we read fiercely? Do we read dangerously? Do we read enough of those texts that are written dangerously or dangerously written, fiercely written? I would like to suggest that Dr. Wilson today became an activist herself. We might, in fact, call her the activist critic um, because here she was speaking freely forcefully, fiercely, dangerously, I should say, about the value of reading by all persons, the value of literature, promoting reading, promoting literature, something that our, our faculty is beginning to um, understand and beginning to talk about a little more, I think. Um, I think that your talk also was simultaneously a, a celebration of writing by French Caribbean women writers, but also of Caribbean writers in, in general. Um, I, as, as I sat and listened to you, I, I thought that there was no way I could come back here and resist the urge to recognize a number of very outstanding Caribbean writers who are present with us today. And I would like to recognize the presence of our own Professor Edward Ball. Um, <laughs> Professor Mervyn Morris, who is our outgoing poet lawyer. Dr. Velma Pollard, where is she? I know she came in. Yes, yes. And so thank you for also making this uh, a celebration of, of Caribbean literature, Caribbean writing. We have, uh, I would like to invite um, Dr. Vioria to present a small token of appreciation to Dr. Wilson for this very interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Wilson. On behalf of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures and the University of the West Indies as a whole, for accepting the invitation to launch this distinguished lecture. Although we know here professor can be very, very persuasive as well, and sharing with us a very stimulating topic, which now more than ever proves the relevant not only is relevant not only within the Caribbean context but beyond, 
as it reminds us of the indeniable, indeniable subversive role of literature and language, uh, empowering women and giving visibility to voiceless subject and the other. I can only regret not knowing you better, but because or you left too soon, or I arrived too late, <laughs> and uh, I have only heard amazing things about you as an academic colleague, as a person. And I have to thank um, Professor Ramsey, not revealing the name of the person who was researching about you, because I didn't know much. Uh, so I was, I was, it was myself asking uh, about you, about how you were when you were here, and I just could hear really amazing things about you. And uh, I just hope that you will keep collaborating and mentoring younger generations, as Mr. Miller did with you, and uh, as you have been always doing here at the University of West Indies and the Modern Languages Department, the Modern Languages and Literature Department, a department that was and still is your home. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for the pleasure, the honor, the privilege of doing this inaugural lecture. Uh, Paulette explained to me that this year will be French, next year will be Spanish, and that is how it will go. And I told her I thought it was really a wonderful initiative, and I congratulate her and the Modern Languages Department on this initiative. Ms. Vanessa Roseway, one of our third-year students, will make a presentation to Dr. Zengotayo. Dr. Zengotayo. Thank you very much. Now I have the explanation of how she came up so dressed up this morning in class. <laughs> yes, because they were properly warned. <laughs> and now Miss Kimberly Taylor will make her presentation to Mr. Lorry. Mr. Lorry, please. Thank you, Mr. Lorry, for your presentation and for so affectionately expressing and sharing your interaction with Professor Kuta. Um, you have certainly helped us to understand um, his character a little better. Um, for those of us who really didn't have the opportunity to meet him. And we understand uh, the cause for your nostalgic sentiment. So thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I messed up the end of it. But no, it's fine. <laughs> Dr. Lindy Jones is being invited, sir, to move the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, to close the proceedings of this inaugural Gabriel Couthard, William Miller Distinguished Lecture, it remains for me just to move the vote of thanks. And it's a privilege, of course, after such a wonderful event. Uh, to those who have participated in the program, um, to our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wilson, uh, for her engaging and truly um, delightful presentation on literature and activism, literature as activism, case study from Caribbean women writing, women's writing in French. And Dr. Ramsey, we can confirm, of course, that you made a wonderful selection uh, for this inaugural lecture. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> uh, to Mr. Carton Laurie. Um, for doing for us the brief biography of um, Professor Gabriel Couthard. And thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. Lorry. And also to Dr. Uh, Marie-José Zengutayo for doing the um, biography of Mr. William Mela. We also, as usual, have our students very much involved in, in our engagements, in our activities. And I would like to move um, the vote of thanks, just to say thanks to our final year students, two final year students, and to Mr. Darian Reed, um, one of our final year students, 
who did um, the presentation, who did the poem, um, Oraj. Um, thanks very much, um, um, Reed. I know we look forward to hearing good things from you. Oh, oh, you, oh second year, moving into third year. Okay, good. So you remain with us. That's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, Jamal. Jamal. Also second year, moving into third year. All right, wonderful. Uh, thanks for um, um, reading um, Professor George um, Robert Coulthard's recollection, of course, by His Excellency Dr. Lancelot Cowie. Uh, we had some presentations made, and we just want to say thanks to those persons who um, made those presentations. Dr. M um, oh, Dr. Viorio, yes. Thanks very much. Also, Ms. Kimberly Taylor, Ms. Vanessa um, Roseway. Uh, we would also like to express our gratitude for the organizing committee of um, this event um, from the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, uh, Mr. Clifton McCook, Ms. Dijon Lingo, uh, Ms. Sharon Clue, Ms. Chantal Sinclair, Ms. Karen Clark, Ms. Nadine Barnett, and to our, our student ushers, um, some of my students too, um, Casey uh, um, Mills, Ms. Chevelle Smith, and Mr. David Bale. Let's give them a round of applause. We would like to continue to express appreciation for the UWI Main Library for the setup of the event. Um, Mrs. Francis Salmon, Head Librarian, West Indies, Spe West Indies Special Collection, um, for um, the display, um, this display, um, that she took a very short time to prepare and to put up for us, and we'd like to say um, thanks to her. Um, Mrs. Headley and her staff for a delightful and sumptuous meal that you will enjoy in a, in a few minutes. Uh, to the UETV uh, for recording. Yes, Mr. Lowry, you're, you were being recorded. Uh, to, the, <laughs> and to the William Mailer Fund. Of course, your audience for coming this evening for engaging in this presentation. We'd like to continue to express our gratitude and also for your support um, to the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. And to Dr. Ramsey, who comes close. Um, Professor Ramsey, I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Professor Ramsey. <laughs> yes, uh, of course, for um, being the head cook in all of this, um, for envisioning this type of lecture. And we look forward to many, many more wonderful lectures like this. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for, thank you, Dr. Jones, for, for thinking that you were closing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I deliberately did not draw your attention to the fact that the dean was not here at the beginning because he had promised that someone else would have come to represent him. I don't see that person here, but I know that his heart is here. He very much wanted to be here, and he was very supportive of this initiative. I also want to recognize um, our immediate past dean, Dr. Swithin Wilmot, who is here. Who is here. Right. And um, I, I think you're among those persons. Did, did you know Professor Coulthard at all? Well, well, we know you didn't know Spanish or French so, or literature. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and Mr. Joe Pereira, who we recognized as a former member of the department and head of department, but also a former dean of the faculty, um, the, and former deputy principal too. I want to especially recognize Dr. Wilson's family who came out in full force to support her. Um, Dr. Donald Wilson himself, who is a former member of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, um, where we know you, would, she would not be here without you being here, where they are always together. Um, and her two sons and her daughter. Um, I'm not sure, I know one son is a lawyer, I'm not sure what the other one does, but I'm telling you that I kept looking at him and he was absorbed, completely absorbed by his mother's fantastic um, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to just, and her, her sister, Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, the 
I, I just want to highlight, you have heard that every year we recognize outstanding students um, in Spanish with the Gabriel Coulthard Prize. And this is a prize for a second year student with the best performance in two Spanish American or Spanish Caribbean literature courses. We also have the William Miller tuition bursary and this is open to final year students majoring in French. And we have the Bridget Jones and William Miller Trust um, that is given in honor of both of them, Dr. Bridget Jones and Mr. William Miller. Um, and I, I, I want to close with a little excerpt from an email that I had intended to read um, from someone who sent it today. Um, saying, I'm so disappointed that I will not be here. I had so much wanted to be there because of my respect and affection for Betty, my interest in the subject, and my warm memories of Mr. Mailer, who was a remarkable lecturer. Congratulations on this initiative. And the person walked in um, a few seconds after Dr. Wilson. So I'm so very happy. Um, Dr. Morrison, that you were able to come and hear Dr. Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our inaugural Coulthard Mela Distinguished Lecture. We've been honored by your presence. We thank you very much for supporting us, and we thank Dr. Elizabeth Betty Wilson for agreeing to present this very memorable lecture. Thank you all, and I now invite you to um, partake in the refreshments that we have there. Thank you all very much.